Did the NAIA ban men from women's sports? Welcome to Answers News for April 15th, 2024. I am Dr. Georgia Purdom here with Jessica DeFord and Rocket Rob Webb. And so let's get to our first article because I think this is pretty, um, pretty exciting. Uh, when uh, the NAIA largely bans transgender athletes from women's sports in new participation policy. So as we continue to um, advance in the sexual morality, so to speak, of our current culture, what we have seen, sadly, is a lot of men who are claiming to be women entering women's sports and then, of course, winning because men are different than women. <laughs> um, we know that, right? We know that biblically and we also know that biologically, right? They're, they just are larger. They have, better, they have bigger lungs, bigger hearts, more muscle mass. Um, they have, they're taller. I mean, there's you cannot deny, so to speak, that biological design. And so that's why they're being more successful in, um, in these sports than the women that they're competing against. And so what the NAIA do has done, and it's a small college sports organization um, overseeing 241 schools. So that's, not a, that's a pretty significant amount. About 83,000 athletes has said that if you, if you are going to be in women's sports, then your biological sex at signed at birth must be female and you cannot have begun any kind of uh, masculinizing hormone therapy. So taking testosterone or something like that that would tend to build up your muscles and all that. So that's, that's you cannot participate in any kind of athletic competitions at those schools. Yeah, so that's good news. There's a few caveats here too that's a little bit kind of what are where are they going with it as well mm -hmm. where they're talking about how you're, you can't be in competition but you can still be permitted to work out and to practice, but that could have implications for locker rooms and other things like that too. So there's a little bit of a strange caveat there. And as Dr. Mm -hmm. Purdom was saying, we do have the differences that we see uh, physically, uh, physiologically, emotionally between men and women. And that's confirmed by God's word when he tells us that he made male and female, he created mm -hmm. them. And so ultimately we don't listen to what the policies state about these things is what God says in regards to whether or not you're a male or a female. And I also found it interesting, they mentioned at the very end uh, about the NCAA, which is a slightly different organization with a, they don't have, they have more of a nuanced policy about transgenderism right now, but the head coach, Don Stately of South Carolina, who just won the Women's bas National Basketball Championship, she uh, agrees with this transgender ideology and having men and women's uh, sports and uh, spaces but it's kind of ironic because she just won a woman's championship with yep. her um, agreeing with this ideology. It's removing women. You're mm -hmm. not going to have a woman's championship title if you're agreeing with this ideology. Right. So it's just interesting. Yeah, just take that in. Just think about that for a moment. So she's saying that these, uh, these, these biological men who identify as women should be, a, be, should be allowed in these sports. But... Obviously, if she all of a sudden loses that championship, she's going to see, you're going <laughs> to yeah. see that opinion flip there. And so they give a few different reasons for it. Um, number one, they want to offer fair competition. Well, duh, right? Because differences, like Dr. Perman said, there are differences between men and women physically. And so then they said, number two, to comply with some kind of uh, these, these Title IX and other laws. And also number three, to provide these appropriate and reasonable opportunities for transgender athletes to compete. So you see that squishy language in there. And so like we were saying earlier, it's a small victory that we should celebrate. But again, we got to keep fighting, right? We got to keep moving uh, the goalpost forward there. And, and you just think about it, this was unheard of, not even thinkable, just a generation ago, right? Just a generation ago. If you would have said, should we let men compete in women's sport? I think most people would say, well, of, of course, right? That's, that's like, that's obvious. But today, I mean, if you say that men cannot compete in women's sport, all of a sudden you're seen as hateful, you're seen as bigoted, right? In order to, to make that kind of a statement. And again, like JJ was saying, it all goes back to God's word. God's word says, no, he made male and female and he makes you on purpose for a purpose. And a lot of this is due to this, uh, you know, Disney theology, like Brian Osborne always says, uh, do whatever you feel is right, follow your heart. But of course, the Bible says your heart is deceitfully wicked. And just a reminder as well to keep boldly speaking up at the 
the end, they say here that the exact number of transgender athletes competing at the collegiate level is not known, but it is believed to be a very small number. And that's for now, right? You're going to see this keep going up and up and increasing unless we boldly speak up for it. Because otherwise, we're going to see this increasing in our culture, left, right, and center. So it's not just enough to be mentally opposed to this uh, sexual morality that we're seeing, this wickedness. We've got to actually have action. And the most loving thing we can do is to speak the truth against a culture that hates the truth. And courage will spur on more courage. So we need more women mm -hmm. who are standing up against against this ideology and saying, no, I'm not yeah. going to compete in a sport if there's a male competing against me or I'm not going to uh, go in a locker room with a male changing yeah. in front of me. Yeah. Right. And I think too, like, especially at the college level, I'm thinking, okay, where are the parents? Because <laughs> if yeah. I was a parent of a female athlete, right, I'm going to be standing up for my daughter and making, sh and, and, making sure that these kinds of things, as much as I can, um, are not happening. And so it's good to see it was a 20 to zero vote. So every right. single president voted, uh, or every single person that could vote, basically voted, this is what they wanted to do. So that was refreshing to see. But at the very end, as, as um, Jessica was saying about the South Carolina coach, one of the things she said in her opinion was, she said, if you consider yourself a woman and you want to play sports or vice versa, you should be able to play. And I thought, where else, would, how else would you apply this? Like, I mean, let's just think about this for a minute. If I said, well, if you consider yourself a thief and you want to steal, you should be able to steal. I mean, no, just because you feel a certain way doesn't give you the right to do whatever it is that you want to do, right? You can't be consistent with that worldview, and that's the problem with a secular worldview when you don't start with the absolute truth and the absolute foundation of God's word, right, for deciding morality and deciding what's right and wrong. Yeah, so, so, yeah you see that lack of consistency because essentially they say feelings trump truth, right? My truth, your truth, that whole postmodern kind of worldview. And that's a reminder that ultimately every single person needs the gospel message, right? It's not enough just to use these biological arguments, which again, biological arguments are great because they're consistent with God's word, but ultimately what every person needs is they need to have a changed heart and a changed mind that they stand on the truth, not just their truth, not just their version of truth, but the truth, which Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and life. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. All right. Flowers may be more ancient than dinosaurs, but scientists can agree on when they evolved. And so this has been um, a long-standing kind of conundrum within evolution as to when angiosperms, which are the flowering plant, uh, evolved. Because there's been some conflicting fossil evidence. They've been found in layers. Of course, they have, evolutionists have a model and they think, well, this is when they evolved. And then they'll find evidence of a flowering plant earlier in the fossil record. And then they're like, oh, okay, so how do we explain this? How do we deal with it? And so basically what this article is doing is trying to find different ways um, in which they can measure uh, to, to think about when did the flowering plants evolve. And, and one of the ways that they like to use is something called a molecular clock. Um, and so this deals with DNA. So I'm a geneticist, so I love to talk about that kind of stuff. But basically the, the molecular clock is, if you look at this organism and you look at this organism and there's 20 differences, let's say, in the DNA. Um, so then they basically equate that with a certain amount of time and say, okay, so it was this many years, it took this many years for this organism to evolve into this organism or to branch off from this organism. So they kind of use it as a clock, basically, looking at how many differences. So the more differences you have, the more time there is. The less differences, the less time. Okay, that's the basic idea behind it. The problem is, is that when they're looking at these differences between these organisms, they're assuming that all of that came about by random chance mutation, which it didn't, right? We know that God created these organisms, and so the fact that this organism is different from this organism, well, a lot of that has to do with that God created that DNA that way. They're not mutations, right? They're not these they're not um, mistakes in the DNA as one's evolving from another, but rather they're just, they're just differences in the DNA. And that could be part of the created genetic diversity. And there's just so many things with that molecular clock that they never take into account, like mutational hotspots and all kinds of things that could really throw off their readings that make it really, really hard to say from that data, just because these two organisms are different, well, this is when they must have evolved. 
Yeah, and using the science for observable differences between plants and animals and things like that is useful and it's valuable information. Baromenologists or uh, people who study the created kinds need that information and it's useful for understanding things about the world and the way God created it. But they often will point to convergent evolution, saying that similarities in structures or homology, like they mention whale and fish fins being similar here, that implying that they're co from a common ancestor and that will use that as an excuse for evolution. Um, but homology or similarity in structure does not imply common ancestry. And it's also important to remember here that in the biblical worldview, God created plants on day three of the creation week and land animals, which would include dinosaurs on day six. So we would expect the plants and the flowers to be older and created first before the dinosaurs as well in a biblical worldview. Yeah, so we agree. Flowers are more ancient than dinosaurs. Yeah, so you by three fight days. By whole, three whole <laughs> right. days there. And so obviously they, they can't quite agree on it. They can't quite get their story right. It hasn't really taken root in their uh, circles. Funny. Root. I got it. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, we got that. Okay. But, um, I mean, if you just read it, it's like all of these different evolutionary articles. There's lots of storytelling based on man's word, and so you kind of get through it all. And at the very end, uh, they mentioned Charles Darwin here, his hypothesis about flowers, and that's really where this struggle kind of sprouted from, sprouted from, um, was from Darwin called... <laughs> Oh, you know it's this not evolution. good if you have to repeat it, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those days. I have a case of the Mondays today. Um, it's it's uh, Darwin called the evolution of flowers an abominable mystery. He just couldn't figure it out because he has the wrong starting point. Like we say all the time, if you have the wrong starting point, you're going to get the wrong conclusions. No surprise there. So they're puzzled about it. And the article claims that they determined this timing, like Dr. Perrin was saying, through this, uh, this, this molecular clock and that they observed gradual changes over time. That's not true. They didn't observe these things, right? That's an interpretation based on their worldview. Remember, science is observable, testable, and repeatable. So the question is, did they observe, did they test, did they repeat evolution millions of years? No, of course not. So whenever you have an ex uh, extrapolation from previous data to the distant unobserved past, it it's going to require certain assumptions, right? And those assumptions are based on what's called naturalism. They have naturalistic beliefs about the unobserved past. And like JJ was saying, biblical worldview, plants were made on day three, dinosaurs did on day six, and God made plants and flowers to reproduce after their kind with a tremendous amount of variety. And that's why we see so much, so much variety in nature today with the flowers and the plants and the trees and everything around it. It's because of God's word, because the, of God's creation. Yeah, the last sentence of this also points to God's design and creation because it yep. says, so the next time you marvel at a vibrant flower or enjoy a juicy fruit, remember that the story of angiosperms is a tale of resilience, adaptation, and beauty. Yeah. So they are really pointing yeah. to God's good design and his creation and the beauty that we see in his creation. And pause for a moment. I think, and how do you get that from a materialistic worldview, right. right? So a lot of these guys, they stand on the materialistic worldview, which means all that there is is matter, just matter and motion, just nature. But how do you get beauty out of the nature? Right. So you see that borrowing from the biblical worldview in order to make that statement. And we do have some amazing preservation of flowers. You know, we think mainly of fossils as being bony materials, but soft material can be preserved too. Like you see this in this amber. Um, and so, and when you look at these flowers, they look a lot like flowers today, okay? okay. Um, because again, it's not been millions and millions and millions of years. It's only just been a few thousand years. And we find exquisite preservation of things like flowers because of the flood, things were buried rapidly and deeply. And that's how we can get that that level of preservation. And so, um, yeah, it's really not about, and, and what was interesting too, I thought that at the very end, they tried to link this to, well, we need to understand the evolution of flowers because it will help guide efforts in agriculture and conservation. And I'm like, no, that's totally disconnected from that. Okay, how flowers got here <laughs> and how, and then, mm -hmm. and then understanding conservation and agriculture, that's something we can study in the present and see and experiment with and, you know, all of that. But it has nothing to do with how flowers got here. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so anyways, uh, um, that's, that, they always try to link it to something like that, right, within that what we would call observational science to try to make it relevant, right? They want to say, this is why we're studying this. Um, but a lot of the different methods, they talk about a couple other different methods in here also for estimating the age of flowers and when they first evolved. But all of their methods is really interesting, lead to different um, stories, evolutionary stories. So that should tell you something's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Something, they all should point to the same thing. That's what data usually does if we, you know, and so it helps you formulate the right idea, but it's not. So yeah, therefore not, their not original consistent. idea is wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. 
Um, moving on, the evolving attitudes of Gen X toward evolution. All right, so they're not Gen X, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it was interesting to read this because they basically polled 5,000 individuals who were born between 1971 and 1974. So that's right in kind of the middle of the Gen X birth years. And um, so I was born in 1972. Um, so that puts me right in the dead center of this. And they were talking about how in middle school and high school, um, about you know half of the individuals were really de debating whether evolution is true, at least the evolution of humans. Uh, and they were they, not necessarily buying into those ideas, but you know some of them were. And then the idea was as they got more and more education and went out into the workforce, they started to be more leaning towards evolution. And so when I was thinking about this, I thought, well, one of the things too is I remember I went to public school for my entire school career. I don't remember ever really hearing much about evolution. The teachers just didn't bring it up. Um, and I remember us even skipping that chapter <laughs> uh, when I was in school. And so I think a lot of that comes from the teachers in their generation. They were, um, they were more, tend to be more Christian or at least Christianized and not want to bring up like maybe divisive topics in the classroom or um, they didn't believe it so they didn't bring it up. So, um, and I came, I was in a good Christian home that was obviously teaching me those things, you know, about evolution weren't true. But it is just really interesting to think about how it's different today, like for your generation. Yeah, it's true because in our generation as millennials, we were taught it as fact mm -hmm. in school. So mm -hmm. that change in just a few uh, short years is really interesting. And they also talk about, too, I, I would be curious to know some, uh, some more information in regards to the study that they did. I didn't look at it in yeah. depth, but it says that they were looking at strong predictors for why there was this shift and change. And they mentioned um, uh, that there were factors including like fundamentalist religious beliefs that tended mm -hmm. to be a strong predictor of re rejection of evolution. And then they point to college level science courses, the completion of a bachelor's degree or advanced degree, the development of scientific literacy as reasons for why people supported evolution. But not everybody falls into those categories. That's important to know. And people here at Answers in Genesis are uh, proof of that. We have many scientists here who have advanced degrees that don't believe in evolution and believe in a biblical worldview. But the sad thing is you lose your credibility if you're considered a creationist or you go against the evolutionary narrative. And that's just really sad because science and scripture are not in conflict. Actually, it's from a biblical worldview that we can rightly conduct science at all. Science at its root means knowledge. Mm -hmm. God's word tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Colossians 2, 3 through 4, when speaking of Christ, also says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So the reason that we can do science at all is a gift that was given to us by our creator who is the source of wisdom and knowledge. Amen. Yes, yeah, because God upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's why science is observable, testable, and repeatable. And like JJ was saying, you see this fallacy in there, the no true Scotsman fallacy that says, if you're a real scientist and you have to believe in evolution, you have to be, believe in millions of years. Like, like JJ was saying earlier, I mean, case in point, we have Dr. Georgia Perlum here. I mean, she has a PhD and she rejects evolution. Why? Because like we said in the last article, evolution is not science. It's a philosophical belief about the unobserved past. And also, this is nothing new. I mean, every time you read one of these uh, kind, of, kind of articles, you know, they've, they've been doing this kind of tactic for a long time where they equivocate on the word science, right? So they do a bait and switch on the word science. They don't actually define it. And so they define science meaning evolution millions of years. And then all of a sudden throughout the article, they switch to a, to a more of an observational science, you know, observational science that where we can observe, where we can test, where we can repeat things in the present, in the laboratory, for example. So you have to make, make sure, be careful with that when you're reading through uh, a lot of these articles here. And they also say here, like JJ was saying, um, they, they believe one of the, the factors here is the fundamentalist religious beliefs tend to be strong predictors of the rejection of evolution. In other words, meaning Christians who stand on God's word un, unashamedly, uncompromisingly, they're the so-called fundamentalist religious beliefs. But you think about that statement, that's actually a very ironic statement because what they're pushing right now is a humanistic religious indoctrination with evolution millions of years. So you see that inconsistency there. And then, uh, and then of, of course, they say with people with college degrees, you know, the science Scientific literacy, that's what they put in here, biological literacy, scientific literacy are more likely to accept this evolutionary beliefs. But again, you got to define science. What does science actually mean? It's observable, testable, repeatable. But I think at the end of the day, really, it's just a reminder as Christians, we still have work to do, right? We got to disciple the next generation, give them the answers that they need to help defend their faith, help them know what they believe and why they believe it. Ultimately, it starts in the home as well. If you're a father, if you're a mother, um, make sure you take that very seriously. Make sure that you uh, help your children have those answers against a world that's going to challenge 
challenge them, that's going to seek to eliminate their faith, that's going to be pushing these humanistic beliefs towards them. And again, like we say a lot, uh, you can't take evolution in the millions of years. You cannot add it to the Bible. You need to reject. You've got to stand on God's word for all of your thinking. There's a lot of young adults probably too who feel very discouraged, who love God's word, but are in the science field. So just take courage. Know mm -hmm. that there are scientists mm -hmm. out there who love God's word, who are doing credible science, sound science. So be encouraged, <laughs> stay the course, and be obedient to God and stand on his word through it. Yeah, you don't have to choose, but it's not, it's not a debate of science versus the Bible. <laughs> it really isn't. It's about faith in God versus faith in man, yep. right? That's really what the issue is. Where do we put our faith in? And so um, we need to help people understand that because I want Christians to be encouraged and go into scientific field mm -hmm. because they're starting with that right foundation, that right basis. And we know of a lot of Christians throughout history who have, some, who have made really amazing finds, right? Mm -hmm. Because they started with the fact that God is the creator and he has designed an intelligent, um, logical, orderly universe that they can study and find out more about. Yeah, exactly. All right. Arizona reinstates 160-year-old abortion ban. So this is a nice victory to see in the state of Arizona. That they, um, basically, their highest court there upheld the 1864 law that bans basically all abortions. So um, from the moment of fertilization and um, under all conditions. So even in conditions of like incest and rape um, to not allow abortion to take place. And so, um, so when Roe Roe v. Wade got overturned. Um, the question was then, uh, could this be upheld? And um, it was. And so that's refreshing to see. Now, of course, it's going to be challenged, right? That's, that's just the way these things go. Um, but at least for now, and I think they said it, some of this wasn't going to take place until May. Um, so there's a little bit of a time lapse there, but um, trying to uphold this abortion ban in the state of Arizona. Yeah, it's super encouraging. And I am pregnant and I have an unborn baby. So mm. I'm very excited to see when they uphold the sanctity of life in these issues here. And what I find so interesting too, with so many of this, the people that go against some of these is the euphemisms that are often used in regards to um, so-called abortion. They'll talk about women's health care, women's rights or reproductive rights, but it is the complete opposite of that. It is literally a deletion of reproduction. It is not reproductive rights. You are removing reproduction because you are killing a precious baby that is made in the image of God. And so it's sad uh, to see those euphemisms that are used in place of support and of abortion. Yeah, they, yeah, they say that a lot. I actually grew up in Arizona, so I've been involved in this battle for many, many years. So, so it's really great to see this. Praise God that they finally reinstate this. This is something we've been praying about for a long time. 13-3603 is the name of the bill here. But I want you guys to notice that in, a lot of these news articles today that are talking about this, they say that it, it bans nearly all abortions. We want to add a little caveat to that. So 13-3603 simply made it illegal for the abortionist, right, the abortion doctor, um, not allowed to provide abortions. There was another bill that was also repealed before, 13-3604. That would have made chemical abortions illegal, but sadly, that's no longer on the case right now. Um, but as, as you're going through this article here, like JJ was saying, you see euphemism after euphemism. They say, talk about ending their pregnancy rather than actually using the biblical language here. And they also use the typical pro-abortion argument of trying to say, well, what about rape? What about incest? What about life of the mother? But by the way, those are less than 2% of the cases, but they always like to focus on that, right? Right? They always kind of ignore the 98% and they focus on the 2% there. At the end of the day, though, um, like Dr. Purdom was saying, too, they're, they're going to be challenging this bill, sadly. And so make sure you guys stay in prayer about this. Um, and also, if you live in Arizona, make sure you call up your legislator. Call up your legislator and be like, look, do the right thing. Don't compromise principle for pragmatism. Because um, what's, what's happening right now is it's not just the pro-abortion, it's not just the Democratic um, legislators, but it's also a lot of the pro-life Republican legislators that are right now trying to repeal this law. I mean, just pause for a moment. Let that hang for a moment. So again, every Arizona, you got to send the message to them. Stand up for principle. Don't compromise principle here, because the, the compromise is amazing. It's astonishing that's what we're seeing with this. Um, State Senator T.J. Shopes, one of them, Representative Juan Siscomani, David Schweikert. So those are just a few of those. There's a lot of them out there. Um, but again, we, we, we should be celebrating these small victories, of course. But we reminder, we've got to keep fighting for this war on the pre-war that's happening. It's a reminder to stand strong. Stand up for those that can't stand for themselves. Be a voice for the voiceless today. But they did say, it was interesting in the article, it said only 7% of Arizona voters said they supported an outright abortion ban with no exception. Mm -hmm. So if it does come for a vote by the public, um, chances are 
it will get voted down. I mean, you know, they'll they'll put a new rule or new yeah. law um, in in effect. But um, that's again why we need to be able to we need to make our voice heard, okay, for the unborn because they can't speak, and so we need to speak for them. Um, and we need to think about that when we vote, and and we need Christians to run for office, yeah. and we need yes, you we know do. we need to be we need to not separate ourselves in that sense. We need to be involved, um, and because we care about these individuals, we care about these babies, and we need to show that. So. And at the same time, we don't put our ultimate entire trust in these legislators, right? Ultimately, we put our trust in God and his sovereign will that's happening. But that's what's happening a lot of these times with these senators, these legislators. They have this secular conservatism. They're not standing on Christ. They're not standing on God's word. And that's why we're seeing that compromise. That's why it's so important that we get back to God's word as the foundation for all of our thinking, including these kinds of issues here. All right, verdict saying Switzerland violated rights by failing on climate action could ripple across Europe. And so this happened um, obviously in Switzerland where a group of older Swiss women, so they were over the age of 74, um, called the Senior Women for Climate Protection, uh, have decided to, have supposedly won this court ruling that says that um, countries have an obligation to protect people from climate effects and so that Switzerland needs to basically up its game and protect them because they're being hurt by climate change. Yeah, it's... <laughs> what do you think, Jessica? I, well, there's a lot that could be said here, but they're, they're citing human rights as a reason for promoting this and that the governments need to reduce carbon emissions um, for climate change. But it's important to note, well, what do they mean when they're saying climate change here? And when they're talking about climate change, of course, we believe that climate's change. Yes, they do. But what they're mentioning and what they mean here here is climate change in regards to harmful emissions caused by supposed man-made climate change. And they're often talking about the harmful pollutant of CO2. But CO2 actually is not a harmful pollutant that's so often portrayed in the media. It has so many ecological benefits that are very positive, that are never talked about. Namely, an increase in plant growth. That's a huge ecological benefit to an increase in CO2. Farmers actually will often pump CO2 into their greenhouses because they know it increases increases their crop yield. That's great news for the livestock that relies on the crops, which is great news for the people that rely on both. So there's a lot of benefits there. We also have technology in place that helps us mitigate harm that could come from using or burning of fossil fuels because we have advanced technology through the use of cheap and reliable sources of energy like fossil fuels that help us um, mitigate some of that. And so we don't see these sparks in harmful levels like the media claims. And if we're truly concerned about human rights, um, we should enact climate policies that promote human flourishing um, through the use of cheap and reliable sources of energy and uh, like fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, countries that are able to produce their own cheap and reliable sources of energy, they can expand their economies. This allows for advancement in technology, access to life-saving medical equipment. We can build infrastructure that helps prevent against climactic events. So there's a lot of benefits to it. And other sources of energy like wind and solar that are alternative are not in inherently bad, but what's often not talked about in the media is they're reliant and dependent upon environmental conditions. So a wind turbine is not going to operate if there's no wind. A solar panel is not going to operate if there's no sun. And they often need to be backed up by a cheap and reliable source of energy, mm -hmm. fossil fuels. So we don't ever really talk about that. Um, so these alternative energies, we can use them, but we need to remember when we're using them, we need to use them for the glory of God and the benefit of our neighbor as well to promote human flourishing. There's there's an important creator-creature distinction that needs to be made here. So often climate change in the media is a religious movement that elevates planet over people and doesn't consider the inherent value of people that are made in the image of God and that we don't worship the creature, we worship our creator. Perfect. That was well said. The only thing, only other comment I made is just let Switzerland get back to making cheese and chocolate. Right? They're, they're really good at that. So there you go. And to say, Jessica and um, our CEO, Ken Ham, have a new book coming out on climate change for yeah, kids. Yeah, be on the lookout for that. Right? Yeah. So that'll be coming out hopefully very soon. Very yeah. soon. Mm -hmm. um, so be watching, be watching Answers in Genesis, our resources, our website for that information on that. Yeah, All right. Exciting. The universe's accelerated expansion might 
be slowing down. And so this is a, it was interesting to read through this article and just look at how they're trying to explain things in the universe they can't quite explain um, mm -hmm. with things like the Big Bang um, and other ideas. And so Rob here is um, our rocket scientist. So he is going to explain a little bit more about, so what, what is going on with this? You yeah. need to translate oh. for me. Oh. I, I spaced out with this. <laughs> she spaced there out. We're go. the there, biologists. Here's my so. pun yeah. for you. <laughs> I'll see if I can give you this out of this world explanation in the next <laughs> two minutes. And so um, it's like with all of these articles, right? There's lots of assumptions upon assumption upon assumption, and they basically just kind of state it as a fact. And so this is kind of going back to the fact that we see the universe expanding around us. And it's not just exp expanding, but it's also accelerating. So it's getting faster. And based on the data, some of the Hubble relations data that they're looking at, um, there seems to be an inconsistency with the constant, which is kind of funny, right? An inc inconstant constant there. So the cosmological constant is not constant. It's basically what they're saying. And so they're trying to figure out why. And so we have a, we have a couple different interpretations that they have. And by the way, both creationists and evolutionists, we, we can agree that the universe is expanding. It is accelerating, but we interpret that data based on our worldview. So with the evolutionists, they're going to interpret it based on what's called the Big Bang. So they're going to have the naturalistic uh, origin story, the cosmogony, to be able to explain the assumptions. Uh, this is actually a repeat of a study that was done about 2,500, about, not 2,500, 25 years ago. That was more of a direct observation that, that, they, that they saw. This one's a little bit more model-based, so it's going to be more um, assumption-based based on that Big Bang model again. And so what, what they're saying is uh, uh, the expansion rate is due to what's called dark energy. You've probably heard that before, dark energy, not to be confused with dark matter. Uh, dark matter is a totally different category. You can actually jump onto our website, learn more about that. Um, both creationists and evolutionists, we would agree completely on dark matter, but whereas dark energy, we would differ a little bit more on that. So uh, evolutionists, they're going to be very dogmatic on that dark energy being the explanation. So they're saying, well, maybe dark energy was evolved over time. But again, it's based on the assumptions because when they say um, they're measuring these positions because the further away they are, the more we go back in time to a younger and younger universe. Again, that's based on the assumption that the light from those stars is taking millions and billions of years to reach us. Again, that's, that's based on their assumption, based on the Big Bang model. And so I think as, as a summary here, um, the cosmological constant is not constant, and they're trying to figure out why. And again, it comes down to that interpretation. Do we stand on man's word for the interpretation or God's word? Yeah, great. So I'm glad he translated that for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, just a couple of things as we finish up here. Uh, we have this uh, great curriculum called Mrs. C and Me, Journey Through the Seven Seas of History. So this is designed for kindergarten through second grade, and it's great to use. It could be used in a Sunday school setting. It could be used on like a, a Bible program maybe that you have. You could use it in your home. Uh, it's great for any kind of small group church. It's a very flexible curriculum, um, any, anywhere that you want to use it. It's got a lot of activities, games, crafts. Um, snacks, you know, it's kind of a little bit like VBS in that sense, um, but it's going to go through 48 lessons to really instruct children. And it's got these great animated videos that go with it with Mrs. C and her friends. And so encourage you to check that out. We also have coming up next year, um, believe it or not, it's been 45 years since Mount St. Helens erupted. And so we are planning a trip there, the 45th anniversary trip, August 18th through the 22nd of 2025. So you have plenty of time to plan. We've got some great savings for you if you register this year. I'm super excited. I know I'm going to be going on it. If you need any help, just, and just trying to hike um, <laughs> and do all these things uh, to see. Uh, and because a lot of the research that was done as a result of the Mount St. Helens explosion really helped creation scientists and to understand how when you have a catastrophic conditions, lots of things can happen geologically very, very rapidly. And so um, I'm really excited to be able to go on that trip. And then a couple of resources that we have. Uh, this is Glass House called Shattering the Myth of Evolution. So we talked about some different evolutionary ideas like with flowers, but there's tons of those things that are being, again, um, promoted all throughout uh, textbooks, um, on TV, and this really helps shatter those myths and to understand what, how do we understand this when we start with a biblical worldview and showing how science confirms it, and it's written for lay people, so it's a tremendous resource. And then Crafted by God, so this is my own book um, that I co-authored with my friend Stacia, and it's a really great pro-life book for kids, helping them understand that we're all made in the image of God, regardless of ethnicity, disability, gender, all of those things. I'm really helping them um, grasp those biblical concepts and confirmation of that, and it's based off our Fearfully and Wonderfully Made exhibit, so it's got some great images um, in there for children to understand the development of the baby in the womb, so I highly encourage you to get that, and we're out of time for today, so we'll see you back here next Monday. God bless.